Uh, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, of course, very grateful to the uh, Foreign uh, Policy Association for uh, giving me the uh, opportunity to uh, address this uh, distinguished uh, audience. Uh, you are uh, an organization uh, dedicated to uh, inspiring the American public to learn more about the world uh, internationalism and this is really at the heart of your action. Now the World Trade Organization, which uh, uh, I now uh, head, is also founded on the principle of uh, international cooperation and in my uh, remarks this evening, uh, I would like to highlight uh, the ways in which it uh, helps improve uh, growth, but not only growth, also the security uh, across our world. I also want to underline uh, how much uh, is at stake in the uh, current uh, round of WTO uh, negotiations, uh, which we uh, call in our jargon the uh, Doha Development Agenda. The WTO was uh, established in uh, 1995 in the wake of a long and uh, arduous uh, series of uh, negotiations uh, known as the Uruguay Round. Its creation uh, marked a major turning point in uh, international trade relations and the US had a major role in bringing it uh, to light. Compared to the GATT, the General uh, Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which preceded it, uh, the World Trade Organization provides trade rules covering a wider range of uh, areas, trade in goods, uh, in services, uh, intellectual uh, property issues, uh, regulating trade among uh, more countries, and uh, providing a forum uh, where members of the World Trade Organization can uh, settle their disputes uh, about trade and negotiate more uh, and better uh, updated uh, rules. So, uh, very simply, why uh, does trade uh, matter? Uh, why does it matter so much that the uh, international community decided to create a new international organization uh, in the 90s? Well, the answer to that is uh, simple. Uh, trade uh, underpins uh, much of uh, modern society. For the consumer, uh, it provides wider choice and lower prices. Uh, for the business community, uh, it provides more uh, commercial opportunities. For national economies, uh, it provides uh, for growth and uh, development. And in the sphere of international relations, uh, cooperation between countries uh, is, uh, I believe, the only path to uh, sustainable development and growth for all members of this uh, community. And of course, trade uh, is a major component of that cooperation. Trade is uh, one very visible uh, manifestation of a term which has now uh, become a buzzword for many, uh, globalization. Over recent years, we've witnessed a new stage in globalization, the accelerated expansion of uh, market economies, uh, a bit like the one which was uh, experienced in the 19th century uh, with uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's probably a fundamental transformation in society, and this time again, uh, it's uh, the result of a uh, technological revolution. Globalization and uh, increased market opening have had some very positive effects, uh, but there are also uh, some less uh, positive uh, effects. Uh, it has undoubtedly uh, enabled uh, individuals, uh, corporations, uh, nation states to influence actions uh, and events uh, around the world faster than uh, ever before and to derive many uh, benefits uh, from them. It has uh, the potential uh, to expand freedom 
uh, to expand democracy, uh, to expand innovation, to expand uh, social and cultural uh, exchanges uh, while uh, offering uh, outstanding opportunities for more dialogue and more understanding. But uh, the global nature of an increasing number of uh, bothersome phenomena, uh, scarcity of uh, energy resources, uh, deterioration of the environment and uh, natural disasters, the spread of pandemics, the growing and sometimes extremely volatile uh, interdependence of uh, economies and financial markets, migratory uh, movements uh, provoked by insecurity, by poverty uh, or by political instability are also uh, products of uh, globalization. At the same time, uh, there is a widening gap uh, between uh, global challenges and uh, traditional ways of uh, working out uh, solutions via uh, the existing institutions. Uh, globalization is also a, a reality and an ongoing uh, process that uh, cannot be faced by uh, nation states alone. Uh, we therefore uh, need to contemplate uh, new forms of multilateral cooperation at the global level to ensure that this growing interdependence evolves in a sustainable manner. The answer to this uh, big uh, question uh, I would suggest is a combination, a combination of uh, global ambition and uh, pragmatic uh, suggestions. Uh, building uh, multilateral cooperation is a gradual process uh, involving uh, changes to long-standing practices, uh, involving uh, entrenched interests, uh, cultural habits and social norms and values. And the example of trade uh, sheds uh, light on both the opportunities and the difficulties of this multilateral, uh, multilateral uh, cooperation. Although uh, international trade is not the only one, it is, uh, as I said, a very visible uh, dimension of globalization. And the World Trade Organization, as the trade uh, regulator, uh, is uh, definitely uh, at the heart of the uh, multilateral arena. In terms of uh, multilateral cooperation, uh, the WTO's role is uh, based on uh, equality. The principle of equality uh, is uh, reflected uh, concretely in the rules of the World Trade Organization, uh, for instance, in the form of the principle of non-discrimination, uh, it uh, can be found uh, in the most favored nation clause and the national uh, treatment rule, which are two pillars of the uh, World Trade Organization. It, it also uh, underlies the principle of uh, reciprocity, which is at the heart of uh, our uh, negotiation uh, mechanisms. Beyond these uh, principles, uh, the uh, basic value underpinning the World Trade Organization is that uh, opening trade is good. Uh, the multilateral trading system uh, helps to increase economic efficiency and it can uh, also help uh, reduce uh, corruption or bad governance. Trade has played an increasing role in the world economy uh, over the past decades uh, as uh, illustrated uh, by the fact that the growth of real trade has uh, exceeded that of uh, world uh, output. The ratio of uh, world exports to goods and services to uh, GDP was approximately uh, in the order of 15% uh, in the 1970s, more than 30% uh, now, and uh, preliminary figures for 2006 show uh, trade again expanding much faster in real terms than uh, output. The impression has also arisen uh, that the multilateral trading system has uh, evolved to the disadvantage 
of a certain part of the WTO membership, developing countries, hence uh, undermining this basic principle of uh, equality. There is, uh, in many quarters, uh, the feeling uh, that it is necessary to correct this if we want the multilateral trading system to assist in raising uh, living standards and uh, alleviating poverty uh, in uh, developing countries and to lead to more stable political systems at a time of uh, geopolitical instability. Which of course brings me to the current round of uh, trade negotiations which uh, we launched uh, in uh, 2001 uh, in uh, Doha. Uh, the challenge of market opening and globalization for developing countries uh, calls for enhanced uh, international uh, action. And for many, a fundamental aspect of this uh, current negotiation uh, is uh, how to correct some of the remaining imbalances in the current trade rules uh, which work in the favor of developing countries and uh, how do you improve uh, the rules that provides WTO members and in particular developing countries uh, with uh, authentic uh, market uh, opportunities and uh, a more level playing field uh, to compete uh, in, in national, international trade. And this uh, development dimension uh, is not a standalone item in the negotiation, it's rather a, an element that permeates uh, in all uh, negotiating uh, areas. I think uh, no one disputes that uh, completing uh, this round of negotiation uh, is uh, crucial for both developed and developing countries as a, a fundamental uh, tool uh, to harness uh, globalization and to ensure a more uh, sustainable uh, development. But uh, concluding it is uh, understandably difficult. Uh, it is the most ambitious attempt that uh, governments have made to open trade multilaterally uh, because of its scope and because of the number of countries uh, that are now uh, negotiating uh, and that uh, will uh, share in uh, the results. In uh, 1994, the previous round, the Yuga round, uh, wrote uh, the modern rule book of the trading system and this round is now aimed at uh, revising it to open trade and to uh, lock in reform on uh, an unprecedented uh, scale. Now, so why uh, are these Doha uh, negotiations uh, more difficult, uh, more protracted uh, than expected? Some people believe uh, it's because there is no business interest. Uh, some say uh, because there is too much media interest. Uh, others say uh, it's because of lack of uh, leadership. Uh, others say uh, it's because of uh, NGO uh, opposition. In my view, the reason why the current negotiations are so difficult uh, is because this negotiation aims at a higher level of ambition than previous rounds. It's deeper, it's larger, and it wishes to be fairer across the board. It therefore presents uh, political complexities for all participants, uh, mostly under the form of uh, domestic constituency political difficulties, and it will take, like any negotiation of this size, some political courage uh, to bridge the gaps that uh, still uh, remain among the key players. Uh, I just said it's deeper. Well, it's deeper uh, because of the uh, level of reductions on subsidies uh, and uh, import tariffs, which are already on the table of the negotiation and which are roughly uh, 
at least a double of the previous round. Developed countries are asked to uh, reduce their agricultural subsidies uh, and to open their markets uh, to exports from uh, other countries. Some developing countries, for the first time in the history of trade negotiations, are also asked uh, to reduce uh, some of their import tariffs on industrial products uh, in order to facilitate trade both in the direction and from developed and uh, other developing countries. Uh, we've moved in this negotiation from uh, cutting tariffs uh, according to averages, which was the old technology uh, which was used uh, in the previous rounds and which allowed countries uh, to uh, protect uh, tariffs on the specific products. Of course, if you have uh, to uh, decrease uh, your import tariffs uh, with an average, uh, the natural tendency uh, is to uh, reduce them uh, where you don't have much trade and to keep them where you have uh, much imports. So we move from this ancient uh, and probably uh, obsolete uh, technology to a new technology for reducing tariff. Uh, and this technology cuts high tariffs uh, more than lower tariffs. And of course, the impact on trade uh, is, uh, in terms of opening trade, uh, is all the bigger that you reduce high tariffs more than uh, low tariffs. The end results, if we get there, uh, should be uh, impressive. Uh, for example, the highest agricultural tariffs uh, for developed countries uh, would be down by 60 to 70 percent uh, compared to a 35 percent average uh, during the uh, previous uh, multilateral uh, round of trade negotiations. On agricultural subsidies, <clears throat> what's on the table today is uh, already uh, twice the amount of reduction uh, which was uh, accepted uh, in the uh, euro realm. Uh, if you take the example of uh, export subsidies, uh, this time uh, there should be no more export subsidies. Uh, in services, among the 151 members of the organization, 30, 40 big players with big markets uh, have engaged on a process of uh, request and offers uh, to uh, open trade in a variety of sectors from telecoms to uh, distribution services, from uh, financial to uh, legal services, uh, and that's undoubtedly a much broader, much deeper uh, negotiation uh, than ever uh, before. So it's deeper, it's also uh, larger, and it's larger because we've included uh, in the agenda of the negotiation new issues uh, in the uh, WTO uh, edifice, uh, such as, uh, for instance, uh, trade facilitation, which I recognize is a pretty jargonic uh, denomination, uh, but it's a crucial issue for business uh, because it tackles day-to-day uh, -day problems uh, such as uh, customs procedures, uh, transit of goods, and uh, a number of uh, bureaucratic uh, border uh, requirements. And a successful conclusion of negotiations about new disciplines on trade facilitation uh, will make a very significant uh, contribution uh, towards uh, lowering transaction costs in trade, uh, particularly uh, important for small and uh, medium enterprises. Uh, if the time it takes uh, to clear a container uh, through a border is uh, three weeks, uh, that's sometimes much more important than a 5, a 10, a 15 percent uh, tariff. So it's deeper. It's larger, and uh, not least, uh, it has to be fairer. 
Thera uh, because uh, this round will not only remove obstacles to trade, will not only improve uh, the level playing field, but it will make the development dimension uh, more central uh, to the system. And, for instance, it's already uh, been agreed that uh, developing countries uh, will have uh, to uh, give fewer concessions than developed countries, even if among developing countries, uh, China, uh, India, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa uh, cannot uh, now be put in the same category uh, than uh, the 50 uh, least developed countries of uh, this planet. They nevertheless will benefit from special and differential treatment with specific flexibilities, uh, whether uh, this is uh, in agricultural uh, market opening or whether this is about market opening uh, in uh, manufacturers uh, or, uh, or services. Uh, there will be as a special and differential treatment in favor of least developed countries a uh, duty-free, uh, quota-free uh, access uh, for most of their products uh, to exceed in uh, developed and in a number of uh, emerging uh, developing countries uh, market. Small and vulnerable economies, uh, islands, uh, landlocked economies will also benefit from uh, specific uh, flexibilities. So, all in all, we also uh, take into account uh, the fact that the contribution to world trade and the benefits to be derived from the expansion of world trade do not materialize the same way uh, depending on the size, uh, the location and the respective uh, advantages or handicaps of a country. In parallel uh, with the negotiation, uh, we are also uh, putting in place uh, an aid for trade package uh, which is uh, aimed at uh, focusing more of international development assistance into addressing uh, developing uh, country uh, bottlenecks. And this uh, initiative uh, is an essential component to help developing countries uh, build the capacity uh, to reap the benefits of the uh, new trade opportunities. Uh, we are in WTO in the business of uh, making trade possible. We all know uh, there is a difference between uh, making trade possible and making trade happen. So for this discrepancy, uh, this difference to be addressed, we need more capacity uh, building assistance uh, for uh, developing uh, countries. And it will also uh, help uh, provide support towards adjustment costs that uh, developing countries will incur uh, as a result of further trade opening uh, through uh, the uh, negotiation. So this aid for trade component, which is a new feature uh, in the activities of the World Trade Organization, not that we will transform the World Trade Organization into a development agency, but we've been settled with the role of uh, coordinating, monitoring, uh, evaluating, and mobilizing more of this international development assistance as a complement uh, to the negotiation, and of course not as a substitute uh, to uh, an ambitious uh, outcome of the round uh, for developing uh, countries. At the time of the creation of the WTO, a uh, key element of the new organization in the eyes of its uh, founding fathers, including, by the way, the US, was uh, the dispute settlement system. Uh, this uh, peaceful uh, means of uh, settling disputes uh, became enforceable under the WTO underscoring the rule of law and making the trading system more secure and more predictable. The high level of recourse to the dispute uh, settlement system, we've had around uh, 400 uh, complaints 
uh, in 10 years uh, is uh, testimony to the confidence that WTO members have in uh, the ability of the dispute settlement system uh, to deliver effective <coughs> rules-based outcome on uh, their trade disputes. And it's generally acknowledged that overall the system has uh, functioned extremely well uh, so far. Uh, but, of course, like in other uh, areas, uh, there is uh, room to uh, improvement and the entire membership also agreed uh, to improve and clarify uh, this uh, system, uh, proof as it were needed that the system uh, protects all members, uh, not just uh, the large, uh, the strong uh, and the rich uh, among them. Now, what uh, remains uh, to be done? Well, what remains to be done to conclude this negotiation uh, is, in my view, uh, quite modest, uh, if you compare it to uh, what's already uh, on the table. The quantum uh, trade opening, which is already on the table, represents two or three times uh, what was achieved in the previous negotiation. Uh, but I think uh, this price for concluding uh, is also modest uh, compared to uh, what would be the cost of a failure, uh, the loss of uh, huge economic benefits for all countries involved, and also uh, the weakening of the uh, multilateral trading system uh, with an obvious risk of increase uh, in protectionism at a time uh, where uh, the macro economic outlook for the world economy uh, is probably more on the downside uh, than uh, on the upside. And I do not think uh, anyone with a an interest in international affairs uh, needs uh, reminding uh, where protectionism uh, has uh, led the world uh, in uh, the past. So it's useful to try and put the concessions uh, needed to conclude this negotiation into their proper uh, perspective. Uh, for example, uh, Reaching an agreement on subsidies uh, depends on a few additional concessions from the US uh, which are equivalent to uh, less than a week's worth of uh, transatlantic trade. Uh, it also depends on a handful of uh, percentage reductions in the highest uh, agricultural tariffs from EU or Japan. It also depends on a handful of additional percentage reductions in the highest industrial tariffs by uh, emerging uh, economies such as uh, Brazil, uh, China, uh, India, uh, who will have to implement these uh, concessions if agreed, not uh, overnight, uh, but over a transition period of several years to leave space for a smooth uh, adjustment. Although uh, it's not alone in uh, being uh, solicited to make uh, large concessions, but marginally higher concessions than what they've already made, uh, to get a deal on the round, uh, there is a perception in the US that uh, a lot is being uh, requested of it. Uh, whether uh, this uh, perception uh, is right or not, uh, the reality is that the US uh, stand to gain a lot uh, from uh, such an agreement. Uh, it remains uh, the world's richest economy. Uh, it remains a major architect of the multilateral trading system. It remains one of the most open uh, economies on this planet. So its strategic interest is to make sure that other economies are just as open. Which is why I believe that uh, a credible and effective multilateral trading system uh, is not the sort of uh, optional extra uh, for the US. Uh, it is uh, an irreplaceable uh, insurance policy 
against protectionism, against protectionist surges, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, if they would materialize, uh, these uh, protectionist surges uh, could very uh, severely uh, damage uh, the dynamism of the uh, US economy uh, in the future. Developing countries uh, are going rapidly, uh, and uh, their integration into the world economy would create new market opportunities for uh, American companies uh, and uh, create uh, high-paying uh, uh, jobs uh, in the US, uh, ensuring uh, its continued prosperity. As we all know, jobs uh, which are on the export side of the US economy are, uh, on average, uh, paying uh, sort of 20% uh, more than others. So for all these reasons, the WTO needs uh, the uh, leadership and the active participation of the US in order to strengthen the multilateral uh, trading system for its own benefit, but also for the benefit of uh, other countries. Strengthening the multilateral uh, trading system is, uh, at the end, the very point of this negotiation. Uh, the WTO rulebook, although not very old, uh, needs uh, updating. Uh, the world is now moving at uh, an increasingly fast pace and globalization is forging ahead. Every country is feeling the impact of this and the World Trade Organization can help uh, harness this impact and uh, ensure, again, that a maximum of benefits uh, can be uh, reaped from uh, efficiency gains that stem from international trade. But uh, to do that, uh, the system needs to uh, move with the times, and the only way to do that uh, is to conclude this negotiation rapidly, ambitiously, in line with the mandate that governments have signed up so that uh, post this round we can keep addressing new obstacles to trade uh, which are uh, appearing uh, every day uh, because of uh, the evolution of uh, social, cultural needs, also sometimes uh, before of the, because of the cleverness of uh, domestic uh, trade uh, regulators. Uh, you will all uh, have seen uh, in the uh, news that uh, the negotiations are at a critical stage on the principle that uh, bad news uh, sell better than uh, good news. Uh, there is no uh, shortage of uh, stories in the media about uh, looming uh, failures. I'm here to tell you uh, that uh, those stories uh, are, as of today, far from the truth. Uh, they can only come true if uh, apathy or indifference uh, win over commitment and courage. The reasons why the US uh, advocated a strong multilateral training system are even stronger today uh, than they were 60 years ago when they were among the founding fathers of the GATT. The needs for the advances promised by this negotiation is uh, even stronger six years after we started this negotiation uh, than in uh, 2001. And the importance of uh, US leadership in this uh, great effort of uh, international corporations remains and will remain uh, absolutely uh, vital. Uh, I uh, want to tell you in conclusion that uh, I value very highly the uh, strenuous uh, efforts that the uh, US administration uh, has been putting into uh, reaching an agreement in these negotiations. Uh, I was uh, in uh, Washington uh, for the last uh, three days uh, and I spent uh, 
quite a lot of time, uh, as usual, on the Hill uh, because of the uh, specific uh, role that uh, Congress uh, plays in the US trade policy. And uh, I also want to express my gratitude to all those in Congress and also in the private sector who continue to stand up uh, for an open uh, multilateral uh, trading system. I think those of you who care about international relations, and I'm coming back to my initial point, uh, those of you who are in this business, who care about this, need to make sure that uh, the round uh, concludes. Uh, if we were to fail to conclude this round, uh, it wouldn't just be a failure for the World Trade Organization, uh, I think it would be a failure for the world uh, community as a whole. On the other hand, uh, if we succeed, which I now believe is doable, uh, it will uh, light a beacon of hope uh, that this world uh, can work together uh, to overcome a number of its division uh, in the uh, interest of the uh, planet as a whole. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can take a few questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm of course ready to take a few questions uh, if you have questions. There are microphones uh, available. There's one down there. Yeah. Bananas. Uh, that's one of the charms of you know being in the trade is that uh, it's always very concrete. Huh? It's about bananas. It's about meat. It's about scrap metal. It's about steel. It's about cars, footwear, textile. Uh, although on the topic of bananas, I have to be very uh, prudent in my uh, public uh, statements. Uh, because there is a litigation going on within the dispute settlement system. And as, as WTO DG, uh, I sometimes run part of these disputes on a procedural ground. For instance, when I designate myself the panelists, uh, which will uh, judge in the first instance, uh, I have to remain extremely neutral. So, this banana issue has been going on for, what, 25 years? Uh, when, uh, and it started uh, when uh, the European Union uh, decided uh, that uh, internal borders uh, should uh, disappear. The previous regime was that various members of the European Union had uh, a trade relationship uh, with uh, former colonies uh, which were sort of bilateral. France had, uh, uh, was importing uh, at uh, uh, specific conditions uh, bananas uh, from uh, West Africa. Uh, Spain was importing uh, bananas uh, from other parts of the world. And when they had to remove all their border controls when they had to create this internal market, uh, the EU was obliged to create a specific regime of preferences that allowed previous uh, providers of banana uh, to uh, penetrate uh, the uh, EU uh, market. 
And the European uh, Union did this at the time uh, with a specific trade regime which would give a specific advantage uh, to these uh, previous uh, colonies as compared to other providers of uh, bananas, uh, such as a number of uh, Central American or Latin American countries. This specific regime of uh, preferences uh, was uh, contested by uh, countries like uh, Ecuador, uh, Panama, uh, Honduras, on the grounds that it was an unfair discrimination. And the whole stories of litigation, which most of the time uh, were between EU and US, uh, although uh, US uh, does not produce a single kilo of bananas, and although the production of bananas in the European Union has shrunk to a very, very minimal proportion, mostly uh, in uh, Caribbean uh, French islands and uh, in uh, Portuguese and uh, Spanish uh, islands in the Atlantic, uh, this dispute has been going on and on and on. Uh, the likely outcome uh, is that uh, if the EU succeeds in uh, switching its uh, framework of trade agreements with uh, African, uh, Caribbean and Pacific countries into free trade-like agreements, then there will be uh, no problem uh, because in WTO you're allowed to uh, contract bilateral obligations uh, that uh, discriminate against the most favored nation principles provided these things are clear by the rest of the membership. And this is where the leverage of uh, Latin American and Central American countries uh, starts uh, and they basically uh, put as a condition for this specific ACP regime uh, to uh, be WTO compliant, uh, they put as a condition that the MFN tariff on bananas uh, is reduced. This MFN tariff on bananas was increased uh, recently uh, by the Europeans uh, because they switched their system from a quota system where each country had an export quota into the European Union into a tariff only system where countries uh, compete for access to the European market uh, with a single tariff. So there is a dispute today. Uh, as to uh, how much, uh, when uh, should this MFN tariff be reduced, which of course pitches in some way uh, ACP producing countries against Latin American and uh, Caribbean and Central American countries. Uh, the ACP producers uh, want to keep uh, the difference in preference which results from the difference between the tariff MFN and their own uh, relatively free access and uh, the Latin American uh, and Central American uh, producers uh, want uh, to compete on what they believe uh, would be a more level playing field if the tariff uh, was reduced. So that's the terms of the disputes. I cannot go much further in uh, who's right, uh, who's wrong, who will win, who will lose, what sort of a compromise uh, might be uh, possible uh, at the end of the day. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, among ACP countries, some have become relatively uh, competitive in uh, banana production, hence in banana trade, uh, whether uh, where others, and notably uh, in the Caribbean, uh, because of the small size of their production, because of the climatic conditions, are in a more uh, defavored uh, position. So, the banana saga uh, will uh, still be there for some time in the World Trade Organization, but the multilateral trade rule of negotiations is one of the occasions to move in the resolution of this dispute uh, because the Europeans will have anyhow 
as a result of this negotiation on agricultural tariff reduction uh, to reduce uh, their tariff uh, on bananas. Yeah, please, please. Yes, uh, let me start with uh, a clarification. Uh, we have on the one side the negotiation which was mandated in Doha six years ago, which is about more open trade, new disciplines, rebalancing the system in favor of developing countries, and as a parallel process with a different mandate, this uh, mandate of uh, monitoring, evaluating, and mobilizing aid for trade. So these two things are separate, and there is no trade-off between, let's say, more money in uh, development assistance and uh, rules uh, that would remain uh, development unfriendly. Now, why do we need to uh, increase uh, the uh, trade capacity of many developing countries? Uh, very simple, uh, because uh, for many of them, the sort of potential uh, market access uh, which we create uh, in WTO as a result of the negotiations cannot translate into reality uh, if uh, they face uh, non-tariff barriers or if uh, they have uh, supply side constraints that, for instance, uh, prevent their transport system or their energy system of being uh, efficient. If I am a Rwandan uh, exporter of uh, roses, uh, I have uh, duty-free, quota-free access to uh, EU or to US, which are uh, two booming markets uh, for uh, uh, cut flowers. Uh, so that's great. Uh, zero tariff, uh, zero quantitative restrictions. Uh, the world is free. But for the fact that uh, US and EU have uh, border controls on cut flowers uh, on uh, maximum uh, pesticide residues. So I can ship my flowers, zero tariff, zero quantitative restrictions, but they will be stopped at US or EU border if I don't have a certificate that uh, US or EU customs accept as valid and that uh, states uh, that my flowers match the EU or the US standard uh, for maximum uh, pesticide residues. So that's the issue, sort of issue, which Aid for Trade tries to address. Providing Rwanda uh, with a uh, country-wide system of uh, laboratories uh, for uh, testing uh, pesticide residues probably costs uh, something like $10 million. Not much, but Rwanda uh, does not have uh, this money. Uh, and uh, putting this together uh, entails a number of governmental decisions, a number of consultations with farmers so that the cut flowers are collected in a way, can be controlled in a central focal point. And unless and until uh, this works, I can't export flowers. The moment it works, I can export flowers. Now, of course, uh, there is also a bit of a problem that uh, uh, flowers uh, are perishable uh, and that uh, if uh, I have to uh, freight a, a cargo plane, uh, which I have to pay both ways uh, from Kigali uh, to Amsterdam, uh, the cost is pretty high. 
and I need to diversify my economy and I need to make sure that my transport system can address this. So all these issues, which are for many of them sort of nitty-gritty issues, have to be cared about much more efficiently than has been the case for now. It's up to the Rwandan government to decide that as exporting cloud flowers is part of its trade strategy, which itself is part of its uh, poverty reduction strategy, this is presented by the Rwandan government as a major priority so that donors uh, don't fight uh, between themselves uh, with uh, their own agenda, but that among the toolbox which is available, World Bank, uh, IMF, UNIDO, ONTAD, UNDP, the European Development Fund, USAID, MCC, uh, the Japanese uh, development agencies, somebody will put the 15 million on the table, which frankly for many of them is peanuts. But unless and until this happens, having uh, buckets of money uh, available uh, does not change the reality. So that's what we're after. And we are uh, in the World Trade Organization coordinating now, and we will have a big uh, conference in Geneva uh, on the third week of November. We are putting together a system of monitoring, evaluating, mobilizing, more of these resources and we are cooperating uh, with the World Bank, uh, with regional development banks <coughs> who usually are quite efficient in this field of aid for trade. We've prepared this uh, in the last uh, month uh, with uh, three uh, regional conferences which I attended in Peru in, uh, for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, in the Philippines for Asia, in uh, Tanzania uh, for Africa and we progressively are sort of structuring a system that creates transparency between donors and recipients and that when we have the right uh, numbers on the table will also help us uh, holding donors accountable to the commitments they have taken. They have taken since uh, the G8 uh, summit in Linegel, roughly uh, a commitment to double uh, aid for trade uh, between uh, 2005 and 2010. We just want this uh, to happen uh, and we want to make sure that the sort of tradition that you package and repackage and re repackage uh, uh, development assistance uh, commitments, uh, this time is precisely assessed, uh, controlled, and delivered. Yeah, we've got questions here. Where is the... <coughs> we've got one here and one here. Yeah? Could you please comment on the impact of on world trade of manipulating exchange rates and also about cartel, specifically the oil cartel and its impact on the industrialized nations and international trade? Uh, on uh, cartels, uh, there is no such thing in the uh, international system, uh, nor in WTO, uh, as uh, disciplines about competition. There are areas of international trade law which have been developed, sophisticated, deepened, which are very precise. On uh, competition, uh, there is no internationally agreed rule about competition. There were several attempts uh, to uh, insert this uh, into uh, trade negotiations. Uh, and until now, they've uh, always failed. So, uh, cartels are outside the reach of WTO regulation. They may be within the reach of sophisticated uh, domestic competition policies in the US, 
in Europe, but at the international level, there is no such thing. Now, should there be something like this, uh, many uh, academics, uh, many uh, trade specialists, ANCAD, uh, which is a specific uh, organization of the UN system which regroups uh, developing countries about trade matters, they've all at some time been pushing for that. Not least because the impact of opening trade uh, doesn't uh, always flow to the consumer given anti-competitive practices. So the case is quite easy to make that uh, to make that it would be good, uh, but the politics of it are such that until now no mandate has been given uh, to negotiate uh, such rules. And as you know, in the uh, Vestalian uh, system we live in, uh, you need a mandate in order to negotiate international rules on exchange rates. Uh, there is, in uh, the World Trade uh, Organization, uh, rules, uh, a rule uh, that uh, basically uh, says uh, that uh, countries uh, taking commitments to open trade cannot frustrate these commitments through, quote-unquote, uh, manipulation of exchange rates. This dates from the very origin of the GATT uh, at a time where coherence between trade, uh, currency matters, even uh, social matters, if you take the uh, defunct uh, international trade organization uh, which did not see the light of day and which was replaced at the time of the GATT. So that's, that's a rule which we have. Uh, this uh, rule uh, has, uh, until now, uh, never been tested uh, in a dispute. And as uh, it might be that someday uh, it is uh, tested uh, in a dispute, uh, the uh, WTO DG uh, has to remain mute on how uh, this dispute uh, would be handled. But in terms of day-to-day -day surveillance of the exchange rate system, uh, the uh, postal address uh, is uh, IMF uh, Washington DC uh, and not uh, WTO uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, 